post-COVID era, um, focused on the media and culture sectors. Um, we uh, are just going to give it one uh, minute uh, before we start. Sorry. Great. Welcome. So sorry. No worries. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I think we can start. We have everyone now. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome, uh, as I said, to this virtual panel, which is the first uh, of a series that we at Borough Happold are hosting called Adaptive Cities in a Post-COVID Era, uh, with this panel focused on the media and culture sectors. Uh, I'm Shion Lotfi, Head of Economics at Borough Happold, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, my understanding is that um, we have quite a diverse audience joining us today, uh, representing a wide range of institutions and entities, so it seems appropriate uh, to uh, provide a very brief uh, introduction and background on why we've decided to host this panel, and then I will introduce our uh, esteemed uh, panelists. Um, so let me uh, share my screen, and hopefully uh, this will work. Um, one of the panelists, let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, now let me... Uh, full screen it. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, so just to start off to provide context on uh, Borough Happold and why we are hosting this panel, we are a uh, global multidisciplinary firm with a strong commitment to the arts and culture sectors as evidenced by a wide range of projects. Um, that includes projects at the policy and strategic level, um, such as New York City's Small Theater um, Economic and Cultural Impact Study, which was released last year, um, or the film and TV study, industry study that um, is currently underway, uh, as well as projects um, at the institutional level, such as St. Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn, or the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in why did we want to host this panel? Uh, as you're all uh, well aware, the uh, arts and culture sector have been some of the hardest hit um, as a result of COVID and arguably faced the biggest uh, uphill battle and a return to normalcy. Um, so what we wanted to do is to bring together a group um, spanning, spanning a range of um, roles um, and uh, entities and perspectives um, to really drill down into what we think are the key questions at this moment in time, um, which include um, what have been the impacts to the cultural to cultural institutions, artists, and the cultural workforce. What is the role of policy, and how do you make the case for culture? How has um, and will the production and consumption of content adapt? How do you leverage the built environment and the public realm? And what is the path forward? Um, and we are very fortunate to have a very esteemed panel with us today to help us answer some of these questions who I will introduce right now. Uh, Anne uh, Del Castillo is the commissioner of the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. A native New Yorker, she has more than 25 years of experience in film and TV production, public media and arts and nonprofit administration. Commissioner Del Castillo leads MOM's efforts to bolster the city's creative sectors of film, television, theater, music, advertising, publishing, and digitization, as well as nightlife. Jonathan McCrory is an Obie Award-winning Harlem-based artist who has served as artistic director at National Black Theater since 2012 and has directed numerous professional productions and concerts. He is a founding member of the collaborative producing organizations Harlem Nine, Black Theater Commons, The Jubilee, Next Generation National Network, and The Movement Theater Company. Todd Asher has been with Bloomberg Associates since its inception in January 2014, where he develops, uh, helps develop multiple municipal strategies related to public communications and economic development in the media and technology sectors. Prior to joining Bloomberg Associates, Todd served as first deputy commissioner for the mayor's office of media entertainment after serving as chief operating officer for NYC Media. Mark Rossier joined Elevator Repair Service Theater as managing director and producer in, uh, in April of this year after 12 years at the New York Foundation for the Arts. He held a variety of positions at the Foundation for the Arts, most recently as director of grants, overseeing both the fiscal sponsorship department and nine grant programs. 
John Vanko joined IFC Entertainment in 2005, where he has helped craft release campaigns for hundreds of films distributed by IFC Films, Sundance Selects, and IFC Night, and currently oversees all theatrical distribution for IFC Films. Before joining IFC Entertainment, he was president of Cowboy Pictures. He has been a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences since 2019. Uh, and I will share and go back. Uh, and just to confirm, I stopped sharing, correct? <laughs> to the panelists, yes. <laughs> um, okay, uh, my first question is for you, Commissioner. Uh, I just wanted to ask, given sort of the wide range of uh, industries that your agency covers, and to start us off with a, with a holistic perspective, I wanted to ask you if uh, you could let us know what you see um, what, what role you see your agency playing during this time? Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I said the other day that I did not envision my role as commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment as crisis counselor, mm -hmm. um, which is funny and not funny, right? It's like it's, um, it, uh, theater was the first to shut down. Um, actually, the productions had started shutting down in the, uh, the lead up to the pause. And we also have nightlife. So just for the benefit of folks who may not be entirely familiar with our agency, uh, for the better part of over 50 years, we are primarily focused on film and television permitting throughout New York City. Um, and then uh, we uh, took over the operation of the uh, um, TV and radio municipal network, uh, which Todd is very familiar with for sure. Um, and so we run all of the press conferences, the um, broadcast um, and interagency awareness, uh, public awareness campaigns, as well as city council coverage through that division. And then three years, four years ago now, um, our portfolio was expanded to include industry support for music, theater, advertising, publishing, digital content in the way of podcasting and video games. And then, um, New York City Nightlife. Uh, so the Office of Nightlife sits within our agency. So we really oversee the entirety of media, New York City's media and entertainment and life, nightlife sectors um, who have been, you know, it, it's, it's the lifeblood of New York City, uh, uh, New York City's global reputation. Um, and so we've spent a great deal of, of time really um, counseling some of those businesses in, in the nightlife industry, in media and entertainment, initially to really make sure that they had information about the financial assistance programs available, unemployment, we, you know, the one in three um, New Yorkers uh, freelance and half of them are freelancing or do freelance work, right? They're not all freelancers. Right. Work. And over half of them work in the sectors that we serve. So we've been pretty busy just making sure that folks understand what sort of resources are available. And I realize I may have lost track of the question <laughs> <laughs> going through the volume of sectors that we're supporting um, through the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Yeah, no, no, that's that's very helpful. And um, I, I guess to that point, and you know, I, 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 I put this question to you, but also um, uh, to Todd or Mark as well is sort of, you know, you know, as you say, you know, this is crisis mode, which is a little different and, and um, part of sort of, um, you know, there's a current push to, to sort of get support at the state and federal level, get push for stimulus funding. And this is being done by all industries, not only sort of arts and culture industries, but um, oftentimes just due to our political climate, this is often sort of contingent on sort of showing economic value. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be a very sort of restrictive lens for these mm -hmm. industries. So I'm wondering, um, what are ways to address this? Well, I mean, I, I would say it's not a completely restrictive lens. I mean, media and entertainment is the third largest industry in the state of New York, and it generates something like $114 billion. So, I mean, it, while those are not certainly the only benefits of the arts and culture industry, I, I think the notion that somehow it's difficult for arts and culture to, to make its case purely based on numbers feels off to me. I mean, Anne, you certainly know the numbers better than I do, but it, like I said, it's the third largest industry in the state and arts and culture generate something like four or 5% of the country's gross national product. So, I mean, it's yeah. a huge industry. 
as yes. well as a tourist draw and you know all of the ancillaries that come out of it so um it feels it's like a, a case can be made it's close to half a million jobs um just for perspective it's like one in eleven um jobs are in the creative industries and you know some of the things that we saw and that we've advocated for so initially for example like unemployment didn't cover the the unemployment wasn't covering freelancers right and so we got some of that extended to make sure that freelancers largely broadly recovered but obviously a lot of them work in this um sector there have been problems with some of the um the structure of the financial assistance programs not really um, meeting the needs of um, arts uh, and culture organizations. And so yeah. that has really given rise to a discussion about how do we properly support these? How do we, um, you know, even for the city, when we were looking before the federal stimulus came through, we worked with SBS, Small Business Services, to extend their grants to um, cultural nonprofits and sort of understanding how they were able to, to reframe that grant program to accommodate those it took some doing but i think you know i like to look at silver linings in the midst of this it has given rise to a different conversation about how we look at um the cultural sector and how do we properly um support the cultural sector through um federal assistance programs um how do we look at that workforce how do we look at the needs of that industry um, and we've seen a difference in approaches to how we provide that support just in these initial weeks. Right. I would also add that the, the film and TV industries, as the commissioner knows very well, are also highly mobile. So I think it's important to do things at the yeah. local level. And it's a reason why the mayor's office of media and entertainment is so important to, to keep those jobs in New York. Whereas um, studios would potentially be looking at tax credits previously for where to go. Now they might be looking for where's the safe place to shoot, who's open for doing business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just from a perspective from my hometown of Vancouver, where the sort of restrictions are coming, they're becoming very aggressive in trying to attract sort of film production. So you're right, like it is a right. sort of pretty mobile industry. And not to answer my own question, but like I think one of the things we also saw in the small when we assessed small theaters last year was, um, you know, the the total number might be smaller than film and TV, but because it's so much nonprofits, it circulates in the local economy in a much more substantive way than a lot of um, other industries. Um, and with film and TV, it's becoming increasingly embedded in other industries that the city wants to support, like technology or you know advertising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, those those relationships also matter as well. And it's all uh, I mean, it's all yeah. entwined as well. I mean, exactly. you know, people who work in small theaters also work in film and television. Right. There's are also teaching artists who who are doing the bulk of work in schools. So you know, I mean, it it all sort of feeds off of each other as well. Right, they don't operate in silos. That's exactly right. Uh, well, I'm just curious, um, you know, uh, you, you know, Commissioner, like looking at your counterparts in other places, other cities, other countries, or Todd. I know you you work internationally. I'm just wondering, um, are there um, sort of programs and initiatives aimed at supporting culture and arts and media that um, is being enacted in this current situation? By the public sector that could be useful benchmarks and models uh and, and the one that comes to mind and i remember sort of berlin you know a few days after they shut down they just gave direct cash payments to artists uh, which is sort of a very blunt tool but i'm wondering if yeah. there's sort of innovative sort of models being uh, enacted or or being considered at the time at the moment you know it's the the question of how we compare to other uh, municipalities is challenging you know when you talk about uh, European cities, they have a very different worldview of arts and culture and funding, and therefore they have a different funding structure than we do. I do pride ourselves on the fact that New York City was the first to create an arts commission um, and a film and television commission in the country, right? And we're one of the oldest, we have one of the oldest arts um, uh, commissions and uh, film commissions, and our arts commission actually gives um, a significant amount to our cultural institutions. Um, but if you try to compare that to other municipalities across the world, it's, you know, it's, it's not exactly an apples to yeah. apples comparison. Um, 
you know, it's it's a challenge in the city, where, which is also the epicenter of this crisis right now. And there are some very difficult financial decisions that are being made. Um, I, I feel it in the conversations with colleagues and with friends. Um, all of that said, I continue to see, um, you know, I, I think New York City has always had this reputation for, you know, artistic innovation and creativity, regardless of the, the situation that's happening in New York. Um, and so we've seen pretty quickly some organizations be able to turn around and innovate and find new ways to engage audiences and create art, um, uh, virtually bring art, art experiences. We have to figure out what the, what the um, financial model is for that, but... Yeah. Um, and, and that does continue to be a challenge, but I've seen not uh, private funders stand up. I've seen a lot of um, efforts being made um, by the artistic community itself to raise funds and collaborate and reach out and do partnerships. And I think for the first time for some of them, particularly in our space, in the media and entertainment space, they've discovered that government does actually can be helpful, can be a helpful partner in this. I agree. The um, the comparison with Europe is is probably um, an unfair ground just because um, of the support of the arts in France, for instance. Even um, even people that were self employed were receiving eighty uh, percent of their their salary to to support them through um, confinement. There are a number of funds. New York City has the the COVID nineteen uh, response and recovery fund. So there are funds where nonprofits can can get support for um, various expenses, and we've seen these funds being created in the Bay Area and Los Angeles and in in cities across the U.S. So I think that the um, the nonprofit sector is trying to support its um, its cultural colleagues and finding ways to be able to get public and, and private dollars to help get them through. But it, it really does just um, help to, to stave off uh, challenges later on. So there need to be ways for these organizations to see engagement um, and produce revenue. Um, I just want, I, I want to sort of pivot uh, more to sort of the, um, at the sort of company institutional level and, and talk a little bit about institutions, but also sort of creators and the cultural workforce. Um, and I, I'd be particularly interested in the perspectives of, of um, you know, either Jonathan or, or John or even Mark um, um, on this idea around institution companies and sort of the, the predominant narrative happening right now is that, you know, really who's going to suffer are smaller institutions, are independent companies, and they really are the most vulnerable. And so, first off, you know, I would like your thought, thoughts on that sort of the, that framing, but also if that's the case, how are they able um, to adapt, how have they sort of, what, what adaptation tools have they already adopted and, and how can they access the sort of financial support that they need? Um, so I, I can uh, dive in first on this one. Um, so my thought in theory is, is to add a little bit more complication to the question is also not who's gonna be able to pivot or shift, but who's actually gonna like survive this. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of companies that might actually close and we've seen that. We've seen companies say that they are no longer gonna be able to reopen or they are closing um, in the wake of COVID-19. Um, so there is, a, there is a conversation not only of how are we adapting, how are we pivoting, how are we addressing, it's also about what, and this term is, is harsh in this environment, but what, who, will, who, who will die? What companies will actually fade away at the, at, because of this impact? Um, because we weren't able, and it, I think it's a testament to uh, the fragility of our sector Talked a testament to the to the fragility of how we were funded, how we were taking care of each other, how we were thinking financially. Um, I think that I think that there is a larger conversation that has to be put in play of like how this is not just about a small comp small companies and mid sized companies being impacted. Everyone is being hurt and hit by this um, by this pandemic and by the economic structure that this pandemic is forcing us to reimagine. Um, and that's where the possibility comes into play, um, regardless of all of the ways in which um, it is affecting the very, our very essence, our very notion of being, of like, I run a theater, National Black Theater, I run it with Sade Lithcott, and we are in the trenches. Our, our mandate is to gather. 
Like our mandate is to create yeah. gathering spaces for people to be in the same space. We cannot do that mandate. So what do we have to do? How do we, how do we generate our mission and our question to ourselves is how do we potentially evolve in this moment? What is possible that we've been wanting to do that we weren't able to do? And that's really where this forum, Zoom, which we're on right now, becomes extremely possible and exciting. Um, it becomes exciting because it allows for me as an artist, thinking about it in an artist way, what is the, what is the sentiment or the, uh, the granular vibration that is art? What happens when I bring people into a singular space to have a gathering um, encounter? And for me, I'm trying to awaken intimacy. I'm trying to awaken the space of intimacy. I'm trying to ask for people to have a conversation, an intimate space for them to unravel, unveil, and breathe. And so what, how can I translate that into the, visual, into the digital realm? How can I create intimate conversations, intimate artwork, intimate, intimate um, interactions that allow for the energy that is intimacy to transmit through this thing called the computer? So that regardless of time, space, whatever, I'm able to create a creative connection with a community, regardless of a pandemic that's saying I cannot have physical walls to put us in. Um, and I think that's the opportunity that, that, this, that this moment provides, provides us a creative, a creative stance to look at how do we do our craft regardless of the obstacle? And how does the obstacle help us to deepen our intention of creating works that are meaningful, not just for ourselves, not just for, not just for the paycheck, but for, but for the healing needs of what our community is, is, is asking for? Because as uh, working at National Black Theater and working with the community I serve, there is a grieving that is happening. And art is a way in which to navigate that grieving. And so it becomes my opportunity, my job, my, my, my element of service to listen intently to that vibration, to that conversation that's happening in the streets and translate it in a way in which that allows for us to now have dialogue, discourse, name it, and potentially move past it. Um, yeah, I'll just follow up on that. Um, Shan, you know, in addition to my work with IFC Films, which is a a kind of a, a national film distributor, independent distributor based in New York. Most of what I do actually is running the IFC Center uh, in, uh, in New York. Um, and the programs that we produce, including Doc NYC, which is, uh, which is in November uh, in New York City every year and is the largest documentary festival uh, in the country. Uh, and so that's really where I've been spending most of my time trying to imagine, you know, how these um, uh, how how these businesses uh, can connect with uh, with audiences during this period? You know, I think that independent theaters like IFC Center. You know, when we come out of the, obviously, like when we're closed, we're closed. There is we can't do our core mission. A, a lot of theaters have done uh, have have tried to uh, maintain the relationships with their audiences by doing things like. They, the branding is is virtual cinema. It's basically kind of a video on demand service um, that is uh, promoted through theaters. And this is something that's popular with independent theaters across the country, uh, where they kind of make it easier for uh, their their members and their subscribers uh, and their core audiences to to watch the movies that would be would have been playing at their local art house theater. Uh, they can watch them now on on demand and a, a split of of those. You know, kind of virtual tickets goes to the theater. That's that's a model that some theaters uh, have been finding a little bit of um, kind of financial success with. Um, but ultimately, when we come back and we reopen, I do think that that you know the small theaters, uh, the independent theaters, are going to have it. They're going to have um, some different tools in their toolbox than the national uh, uh, exhibition chains, who are going to be so dependent upon the uh, the studio release schedules as they always are. What makes uh, independent theaters, art house theaters uh, unique is their ability to create essentially their own content by packaging uh, uh, retrospectives and curating programs and, and listening to their audiences and, and kind of opening up the whole history and the whole world of mm -hmm. cinema as opposed to just what's on this month's release slate from yeah. you know the half dozen major studios. And so they, they have some, um, uh, and, and that, that creates a special relationship between them and their audience. And so another part that's uh, of this, which is gonna be valuable for 
theaters like Film Forum uh, in New York and the Film Society of Lincoln Center is they have um, uh, large, um, very active memberships that are not going to let them die. You know, Film Forum will come through this uh, because they are very important to generations of, uh, of, of, of movie lovers. And so that, that's something that they built. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a reservoir of support that they built that they're going to have to tap into. But I, I think that the bigger ones, the more established ones are going to be able to, to do that. Um, you know, with film festivals, it's a, it's a whole nother set of challenges because so much of a film festival uh, is dependent upon the social interaction um, that we, you know, that, that, that none of us can do. And so uh, Doc NYC is uh, creating a new Doc NYC global uh, initiative where we are taking a lot of our programs, especially our industry facing and educational programs uh, and putting them online and trying to create a, a structure, a membership structure. Um, some of them for, are for free, some of which they'll charge for uh, and trying to kind of continue the mission in that way. But it's, it's a very hobbled version of your regular film festival. Uh, but since a, a film festival is kind of an all or nothing um, kind of it happens once a year. You know, there's a lot of pressure on, you know, on Tribeca and South by Southwest and New York Film Festival. All of us have to come up with a what's our best case scenario if we really can't have any kind of, you know, in real life film festival at all. Uh, and so, frankly, each of these film festivals is reacting to that differently, depending somewhat on their, you know, kind of their, their financial, you know, how dire their financial straits are. Uh, and also what their, um, you know, uh, what their priorities are in terms of audience. Um, right. And can I, can I just ask, long, I'm, oh, sure. Go, go ahead. No, I just want to ask, because I, I think you're both bringing up an interesting thread and it's jumping sort of to the idea of content and like sort of how do you sort of um, engage. And so I just, I just wanted to pick up both those threads, Jonathan and John, that you just brought up and sort of, doesn't it also speak to sort of the, um, sort of when we're talking about these sectors, I mean, th there's a vast like, heterogeneity. There's sort of a lot of sort of different types of um, people and artists and institutions that exist to it. So to some extent, you know, Jonathan, what you're talking about in terms of still maintaining that intimacy and still sort of being able to create those spaces, it just seems, and, and tell me I'm wrong, it just seems just a logistically harder in the context of the performing arts, whereas film and TV, as you say, John, you can tap into international markets. I mean, I already hear sort of sort of Netflix is on an international buying spree. So maybe that means people watch more foreign cinema. And, you know, so there, there, in some instances, there might be opportunities, but in some other instances, it just might be just so much harder. And so I'm just curious. I, on I, sort only, of, I, only, I only think it's hard if you are stuck on the old paradigm. Yeah. It only becomes all of this, right. all of this only right. becomes hard. If you're like, I want things to go back to the way they were. Yeah. It will never go back to the way it was. <laughs> the idea of normal has now shifted and transformed. The idea of what, what used to be considered a standard production value is going to totally shift and change. Like, like uh, managing, managing directors, artistic directors, directors are having to have, and, and playwrights are having to have a yeah. conversation about what does it mean to create the work? Why did I want to create it? And I think that is a fantastic space to be in. Because you're not just creating it now just to create it. You're not just creating it because yeah. you have the privilege of creating it. You're creating it because it had meaning. You're asking yourself, what was the meaning of the interaction? And I think that if we hold on to the past, we'll never actually learn about what the future wants to give us in this moment. The future is asking us to address and assess the systems that we have been just doing capitalistic systems, oppressive yeah. systems, white supremacy systems that we have just been doing and not allowing for us to really address the need of the heart of this community, the heart of the people, mm -hmm. the heart of humanity. And I think that that's what, I think, I think, I think if you go, if you only look at the past, mm -hmm. you will regret and you will never be able to learn from what this is about to teach us. Like we're doing, we're changing some of our commissions that were supposed to be in person to become radio plays. What does it mean to create a radio play in the 21st century? How can that be inventive? How can that be fun? How can that be innovative? How can that lean us in to like not being on a screen, but having to actually listen from a different space, to imagine from a different space? So I, I, think, I think that there are tools that we have from the past that we can bring into the future, but I think that looking at the past as a way in which that we want to actually bring into the present is not actually propelling us to the future.
But do you think, but, yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, say, I mean, I agree. I think that there are, I think there are opportunities here to reimagine and reinvestigate some things. But I also think, you know, at the end of the day, we're all going to want to be back in a space with people. You know, it may not look the same. It may not be the only thing that we do. But, you know, I think, I think all of, you know, film is different, music is different, theater is different. When, when they start to get into this format, they have a sort of sameness about them that changes the experience. In some ways that, that can be good and in some ways not. Um, I think to Jonathan's point, you know, we want to investigate this moment. We want to learn from it. We want to see what comes out of it that has changed. Um, but I certainly think, you know, an elevator repair service, I mean, at the end of the day, we still want to be in a room with other people as something that we do. And as a thing that makes theater, you know, different than a movie and different than watching TV, I mean, a movie is different when you're in a theater with other people than if you're watching it at home, even if you're watching it on a big screen. I Which to is to one experience is better than the other, they're just different experiences. Well, I, and I just want to scratch at that just a little bit, because when I think about, when I think about some of the archetypes of when we talk about theater, when we go back to the genesis of theater, it was the essential, the essential aspect was that there was a space that was defined, and it could have been an outdoor space. So the, the idea, the space is about gathering. The, the initial right. instinct is about gathering. So we can do right. outdoor theater. We can go back to doing, like people are doing drive-in movie theaters. And that whole idea is coming back into life. Yep. Like the idea, the idea I'm, not, I'm not saying, I, I totally agree with you, Mark. The whole notion of gathering is, is at the heart center of who we are, right? It's at the heart center of our humanity. I'm just saying how we gather, how we gather is the radical That's question okay. of imagination. And can we lean into that radical question of imagination as we have opportunity at our precipice? We have technology at our precipice. We have mm -hmm. a space in our precipice. What can we do with it? And I think that's what I'm more so saying. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, creative people have always been good about saying, okay, well, this is the situation. So let's make the most of this situation. And what do we learn from it? And what do we take from it? Agreed. I think one of the most exciting things that I've seen happening in the course of the last few weeks is from the people that say, no, we don't want things to go back to normal. Like that phrase, like when things go back to normal. And I think the where the most exciting thinking is happening is among the people that are like, no, we don't want to go back to normal. Mm -hmm. An opportunity to really reframe how we think about the work that we're doing in the arts. Um, it's, it's a time to rethink about like that connection to local, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the theaters, like they're like, I don't know when we're going to open, but when we do, like, we really want to connect with local because more than likely people aren't going to want to travel all over the place and bring their germs from all over the place, right? They're going to want to go close. And so how do I capture that spirit, right? That's some of the thinking. I'm not saying that's for everyone, but it's, it's interesting to see that conversation. I've also, and this is not with my commissioner hat, it's just from pure observation, like the nature of appointment viewing, everyone was like, that's dead. But I think appointment viewing is where some people have actually found a point of connection. It's the one time we're like stopping and connecting mm -hmm. because we can't connect in any other way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then also just the issues of access. Like while yeah. there is a bit of a sameness to the virtual engagement with the arts, I am seeing like smaller outfits, like really pushing to get seen and heard and even at the city, we're looking at it differently. You know, we're partnering with um, NYC and company and the Department of Cultural Affairs. There's a um, site, Virtual NYC, where we're really looking at bringing a broad diversity of New York City's media and entertainment um, community into that space and pointing people to that space mm -hmm. to find um, not just sort of the big artistic organizations, but some of the smaller happenings as well. And I think that is a, a great direction and a great outcome to see um, from where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, and just my personal experience, like, yeah, it, to, and to both your points, I mean, you know, the, the old paradigm was sort of, there was often sort of cultural gatekeeping at play. There was sort of, and so if this might be able to sort of, you know, 
change that or shift it or sort of um, yeah mix it up a little bit. I think maybe that that could be could be something that was beneficial that comes out of this. Um, I just want to I just want to yeah. uplift that the one concern because we were talking about some concerns. I know there's another question that needs to be said, but the one concern that I have is that in this moment of adapting and shifting and going to something totally digital um, is that. My a concern that I have is that we adapt out of the the needed we we draw a fear around touch. Mm -hmm. The idea of touch becomes so foreign to us. The idea <clears throat> of touching and that in that need to adapt and that need to pivot, we when we start to needing when we start to Mark's point needing to gather again, the kind of relearning that's going to have to happen that's going to create more trust inside of spaces that are going to be needed, that is going to create more trust inside of the, the kind of facilities that we go to, and also what does it mean to actually be touched by somebody yet again? And then the only, the last thing I would say is, I mean, from, a, from an equity point of view, you know, the notion of who has access to, you know, computers and the internet and video, you know, with libraries not open, with all of the spaces where people who don't necessarily have easy access to those things could go. Um, I just think that's another, another thing to think about is, you know, who is it that we're reaching and who are we not able to reach anymore? Agreed. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you all brought it up, this sort of the, the physicality of what we're talking about, and we're getting a lot of questions, and I think it speaks to maybe some of our audiences around this idea of the built environment in the public realm, and because you brought it up, I, I think that's a good place to go. And so I, I just want to sort of uh, pull at that thread a little bit and sort of understand really um, what does that really physically mean? We're talking about it so far in sort of the abstract, but I, I just want to understand sort of like, you know, and we're still very early, but what are sort of ideas or um, thoughts out there around both in terms of how do you safely reopen the physical spaces mm. that already existed, but also how do you move beyond those confines and really tap into the public realm, open space. Um, and, and yeah, I, I would love thoughts. I mean, that's a question for anyone really, because you all sort of work in, in that sort of, in that frame of mind. So I would love any thoughts on that. I might um, start by saying I think that we're working with a lot of cities around the world and I think one of the things that each of those cities is doing is taking the opportunity coming out of, uh, of lockdown to reimagine public spaces to begin with and that could have to do with transportation, public convening spaces, parks, looking at egress and access to office buildings. So I think there's a big discussion that's broader than just culture or media that's being had right now which I think is a really good one. A lot of the learnings have to do uh, with more green space, uh, recognizing that there have been positive environmental impacts to some of the slowdowns that we've seen. Um, how can people be more established in their spaces? But it means doing it safely. And so I think what we've seen on the media side is that there's efforts like what Tyler Perry is doing in Georgia, where he has a, a really insulated um, studio that he can invite um, productions to come to, sequester them, and focus on testing, um, making sure that there's distance and that there's safe production. But I think there's an opportunity for, um, that there's sort of an, uh, an evening effect that maybe there'll be more documentary productions because they don't require the same level um, uh, and structure, that there might be less studio feature productions or that might be a more difficult mm -hmm. process and you have to chase um, to go to locations where, where it's safe. Um, but maybe it does make it more egalitarian. Maybe there's uh, more of an opportunity for diversity of content and participation in, in content creation. I just wanna um, bring up Diane Paulus um, from ART. She was talking about um, a study that's being done at Yale called Healthy Buildings, looking mm -hmm. at what does it mean to create a healthy building? Uh, thinking about as they're doing their reimagining of their space, uh, she had mentioned that the study was really helping them. Before it was trying just to create a healthy building, like I like we were just it was just a, a, queer, a, a inquiry, and now because of COVID, really having a conversation about what does it actually mean to have a healthy building that can sustain a gathering of people. Yeah. I think that's a one that's one thing to just look at for us to all lean into and I'd be curious about. I also just want to uplift as far as reopening. Um, that uh, National Black Theater, with a whole bunch of nonprofit organizations in New York City, um, are part of this phone call called uh, Culture at 3, at 3 p.m. for about, I think, close to almost 60 days. We have been on the phone at 3 p.m. every day 
talking and actually communicating, um, rallying with each other. And this is across every sector from living, from living museums to, to, non, to traditional museums, to plays, to dance, to everyone just coming together to really coalesce what, how do we solve this inquiry of COVID-19 and the pandemic and the closure. And part of, and one of the working groups out of it is the reopening working group. And one thing that I can just say from listening to those phone calls is that um, the, the answer is so complex that I don't think it's, it's never gonna be one spell solution, but what can happen, and I think that why I just bring up the culture at three phone calls, is that the coalition of just knowing that I have peer to peer uh, people to my front side, um, back, all around me, working to kind of think about how do I create support and foundation for you, for myself, for my sector. Um, I just wanted to uplift that as a tool and resource that is present that I know of, um, that is really promising because it's, it's again, creating a demonetized kind of like unilateral uh, relationship building between peer to peer where it would never happen before, where it wasn't possible before, where CIG groups and um, non-CIG groups are actually talking to another, building with each other and actually moving the pendulum of cultural culture in New York City forward. I just want to weigh in on the the, the no, go ahead, John. physical, the thank you, the the kind of the physical structure and kind of what it means. You know, as as uh, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, drive-ins came back last week, and so as somebody who's very focused on uh, distributing films into theaters and theaters exhibiting them to the public and how that's been short-circuited, drive-ins coming back has been a great thing. There are actually a lot of drive-ins in New York State, not very many close to New York City. Um, and so uh, that's a step, but it, it puts, it, it shows how I think we, um, we have to look, uh, this crisis has, has, has made a need for us to kind of look through arts presenters through a very particular, peculiar prism uh, in that, um, you know, obviously we can understand how drive-ins uh, can reopen before uh, indoor theaters. You know, we, we're, we've all been trained at this point to kind of, to be protective about a having a six foot bubble around ourselves and, you know, to, to be masked and have a bubble of protection around ourselves. Um, and that's, that's all, I think always in the back of our minds and that's uh, totally uh, achievable in a drive-in scenario. And in, and you think about other ways of, uh, of engaging with the arts and it's, you know, this is not a prism through which we had to look, to think about arts, you know, a year ago. But, uh, but when you think about going to an indoor movie theater, um, you know, that's, you know, because most movie theaters are happy to operate at something like 15 to 25% capacity, because generally speaking, we've got, you know, five or six or seven shows a day, you're very busy on Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday afternoon, you're slower on weekday matinees, but you're still running shows, et cetera, et cetera. So it all works into something where a, uh, a reduced capacity uh, is on a, on a business level functional and also in terms of a person coming in and sitting a seat and having a, an empty space around them allows them to, you know, have the experience that they're there for. Um, on, on the other extreme, you know, there have been these announcements about, uh, about Broadway. Um, and I think it's a really interesting comparison because it's such an entirely different dynamic because that business model really requires a, you know, something like 90 plus percent mm. uh, uh, capacity. And so you really have to be filling the house because of course, like when I, when I'm showing a movie at a theater, um, I'm not paying to like reproduce that movie every time. I'm not paying the actors and the director every time I show it. It's a sunk cost. It's an entirely different model than where you're actually creating the art on, on, mm -hmm. on a legit stage and you've got the union techs and you've got the actors and you've got the ushers and you've got all that going on. And so maybe you could have a 25% or 20% capacity and the people in the audience would enjoy it. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not nothing like an expert on, uh, on Broadway production, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, that in our current model, having a 25%, uh, you know, kind of rate of, uh, of sales uh, relative to, to capacity would just not work. And so that's, that's a way in which, um, um, you know, once, once we can, you know, I, I think that a movie theater can be something that can come back well before Broadway because 
that six foot bubble around yourself can be maintained once once we get into once we accept that frankly going into just like going into all sorts of retailers that many of us have not been into recently bars and restaurants and just like small kind of uh shoulder to shoulder retailers in manhattan which you know now will seem like outrageously crowded like how could i ever go back in there once you get past that because like you know if you're in a movie theater maybe you can have your six foot bubble uh, at your seat, but you may still have to go up and down the stairs. You may have to go through a hallway. These things that we're now being told, like, you really shouldn't do that. At some point, that calculation of risk is going to change enough that that we're going to be able to kind of, like, move a little bit more freely, and that's going to seem like a good thing to do. And at that point, some kinds of, you know, kind of uh, museums and other kinds of kind of ways to engage with arts that doesn't require such a full capacity uh, is, is, doesn't, is going to Sorry, can I just doable. jump in? Can I just jump in on that point? Because doesn't that, I mean, doesn't that exacerbate the inequities we've been talking about? Because doesn't that mm -hmm. just lead to the ability for, um, so even in the film, film front, I mean, it's sort of like, it's much easier for, say, an AMC to maintain the bubble than a film forum, or it's much easier where Netflix is not relying on ticket sales versus, say, uh, an A24 that really relies on sort of independent sort of movie attendance at theaters. And so it doesn't it just sort of like, and that exists in museums, too. I mean, again, that ability to sort of create that, maintain that bubble, to do one-way directional sort of um, guideposts, as you're saying. I mean, doesn't this just lead to, yes, adaptation, but does it, is it just adaptation that just exacerbates the inequities? Um, in, in that particular case, I, I think not. I mean, for it's such a different uh, uh, dynamic for uh, chain exhibitors who really need uh, the blockbusters and they really need to max out uh, um, attendance uh, at, in like an opening weekend um, because uh, that's really all they have. They don't have movies that, you know, that, that play for 10 or 12 weeks and they don't play, you know, kind of independent films or foreign films or documentaries. And so, and also they're not gonna get the big movies from the studios because the studios aren't gonna release very many of their tent poles while we're in this partial capacity realm. Um, and so I think it actually opens up uh, a lot of opportunity uh, for smaller theaters who can, um, who, are not, who are not reliant upon uh, the, the, the Marvel tent poles. And, um, you know, frankly, honestly, this will not, be, uh, you know, you, you can have a reduced average capacity um, and still operate uh, a movie theater because, again, that's mo for most of your shows during the week, you're under that 20% capacity anyway. And that's, you know, and that's why you sell popcorn and that's why you yeah. have fewer staff on during right, the right. week and all that. It's just an entirely different dynamic. Yeah, I mean, Commissioner, I'm just wondering on the on the sort of the built environment front, I mean, you know, I wonder if sort of any sort of discussions at the city sort of that you've been privy to sort of allude to what are the potential sort of to access outdoor space. I know mm -hmm. at least on the yeah. on the transportation. Like yeah, go ahead. Late to this, <laughs> so we're having those conversations right now. Um, you know, one of the challenges in New York is the limited public access right and it's like because we have narrow streets we have a lot of narrow streets uh we want to um help locals um uh we have but it's a it's a shared space right so there's restaurants there's culturals there's pedestrians there's deliveries that need to be made and so um we are looking at these you know we have um opened up the mayor has opened up um a certain percentage of streets and is going to continue to do so and you know so that as the weather gets warmer people can social distance more outside but it's it's not it's certainly not without its challenges i often yeah. say you know doing anything in the streets of new york city which has 8.6 million people and runs 24 7 even in a, a crisis like this is is not without its challenges and so we're balancing wanting to help um, one sector without disadvantaging another. One of the things that I have noticed in my conversations um, with constituents, right? We've hosted about four town calls between media and entertainment and nightlife. We've done surveys, we've done focus groups, and we're in touch with 
I mean, I'm on the phone all day. It's literally all we do. Um, but one of the things that I find surprising is, um, you know, our culturals, our cultural workers and our media and entertainment workers and our nightlife workers sometimes forget that they too are residents of New York City that have a voice in yeah. what they want to see in their neighborhood. Um, and so that's something that I think I've, I've really just been trying to hit home a lot. It's like, we're here to represent you as an industry, but you also have agency in your community. Yes. Um, so that when there is a dialogue about what should be in my street, like you should be a part of that dialogue. You know, there's, and, and part of that is also a response to when I talk about film and television production in particular, people say, oh, it's the industry, it's the industry. Well, the industry is a homegrown industry made up of people that live um, yeah. in New York City that need to be part of the conversation about the recovery, not just in their professional lives, but also as community members. Yeah. And I also just want to say that the idea of reopening or, or is, is that culture never closed. Like this is something that we've been talking about um, on the 3 p.m. phone call, um, that we never shut down. We just pivoted. And that the idea of us reopening <laughs> is actually saying that we stopped. That we mm -hmm. that we that that we that we right. didn't we, that we didn't create new right. kinds of ways of interaction. We didn't we didn't take this time to reimagine how to connect with community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think and I think that that's where that's where a linchpin needs to be really understood. That a lot of places paused. Culture did not. Arts and culture kept its right. doors open the best way we knew how, and we did it fearlessly with sometimes not even knowing the city funding was going to show up, not even knowing what X, Y, and Z was going to be, but knowing that our community and that our mandate actually dictated us to stay open, to keep producing and keep connecting. So it's just like, it's a very dicey thing when we say like, when we are going to reopen because we never closed and our physical spaces might need to reopen and our physical spaces might need to have a different conversation, but us as institutions, us as workers, us as people who have been at, on, on some level, the front line of receiving mm -hmm. other kinds of uh, distress and other kinds of need and support, um, we've, been at the blood, we've been on the front line of that and we never stop. I do think it's an opportunity for like architects and builders it's a unique challenge, right? Like to provide <laughs> advice on how you re you reimagine yeah. cultural spaces, like um, you know, to restaurants, for example. Like we're trying to figure out how do you create guidelines for restaurants to social distance and stay open, um, to provide service to patrons but keep them safe. And I, the same would be true for theaters, right, or performance venues um and sets right film sets like that's a conversation that's happening right now um how do you how do you maintain a social distance so that you can continue to create create art um it's that has to be um a, a critical part of the conversation as well as we sort of think about what things look like in the COVID era i don't want to say post because i don't i don't know what that looks like. <laughs> well, <laughs> also but also related to that and i mean it's not just the public facing space. Right. I mean, restaurants, it's what are the kitchen, yeah. what do the kitchens look yeah. like? In, yeah. in theater, what are the rehearsal studios yeah. or places where they build the sets or you know, studios where they're filming? I mean, it's it is the public, and that is obviously the thing that you know most of the attention has been paid to, but certainly what the back end and what the people who work in the industry have to phase is an equally important part of it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I get asked very often, and I feel like it's important to say, particularly in this group, you know, people want, first of all, our, that's not our mandate. Our mandate in, in the film TV world has been to production, to permit um, space for production, right? We're not the health department. We don't do that kind of consultation, um, but also, just working in the media and entertainment sector, knowing how very differently um, productions work, whether you're doc, commercial, indie, studio, those productions work very differently in the same way that different arts groups work very differently. And so I've really been pushing um, our, our creative professionals to really think about the way that they do work and talk to each other and share best practices and come up with a plan 
that we can help them connect them to the city resources that they need to inform them. But I really don't think people want us to tell them how to do their business. Like that's not really an appropriate space for us to, to be in. Um, we're really there to make sure that they have the um, access to the expertise and city guidelines that they need in order to frame a, a work environment that is suitable for their particular sector or uh, art, you know, creativity. Um, I think that's that's something that I, I really hope people understand that um, it's so nuanced and we want to make sure that we're not trying to shoehorn things into a best practices model that is really not a one size I mean that. I mean we're 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 coming very close to the end of the hour. But th this last question has yielded some answers that I find very interesting, and sort of this this idea of. I, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the the ability to do what we're talking about relies on artists, and there's you know, and to your point, uh, Commissioner, and to Jonathan, what you were saying earlier about sort of this need to create still exists. Um, but at the end of the day, um, uh, economic realities sort of <laughs> uh, sort of you know come down on you. And I, I just wanted to sort of end on this idea of artists and the cultural workforce and, and I think we're all sort of New York based here, sort of what that means in New York. I mean, that discussion has been so prominent over the last couple of decades actually about sort of artists and art, artistic workforce in New York City. How do you retain it? How do you keep it? Da, 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 da. And so I'm, in this sort of, you know, climate, um, you know, how do we think moving forward about, you know, what are the geographical implications of this? How do we ensure sort of, even if artists have that instinct to always create, that there is a practical way that they can keep doing it? Um, and so I, I just wanted to sort of end on that note, because I think it's, it's sort of an important one. And I don't know, Commissioner, if you have ideas or others, um, I would love to hear it. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging, um, uh, question, uh, but one that is not new to New York City's creative community. I mean, we could be having the same conversation 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, I just think it looks different each time. Um, I, you know, from at least where I'm sitting, like we're trying to make sure that we're engaging as many people in the conversation as possible, viewing this as an opportunity to bring folks to the conversation that might not have thought to be part of it even just the idea of civic engagement among um, local artists um, and that represent big industries, right? Making sure that, that sort of going back to what I said before, understanding that they are just as much residents as they are working professionals in the city and to really leverage that power to, um, to help frame a future in which they want to see their creative industries succeed, mm -hmm. right? Not just for the sake of the industry, but for, the sake of why they want to be here in New York, why they want to live here, why they've Agreed. chosen to create here. Um, and I know that sounds very sort of touchy feely, but I, I having come up in this, um, in, in this sector, this is what I built my career in. I, I, I truly believe like that is the way that we continue to ensure that there is a space for creativity, that people working in creative spaces insist upon it and work with their uh, communities and leaders to um, ensure a space for it. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I mean, I'm 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 old and curmudgeonly and you know lacking in imagination, but you know I think that places like New York will continue to be, though they may look different. New York will still be New York. It will be a, it will be a place where creative people come, where they seek a community, where there are like-minded people um it may look different but i don't imagine suddenly that you know new york or other large cities stop being large cities and mm -hmm. cultural centers right well i mean i think okay that's that's a great note actually to end on <laughs> sort of very sort of uh 
uh, spirited uh, conclusion to that. I think, uh, yeah, we're at the end of the hour. I wanted to uh, thank this panel very much. I could still talk to you for many hours to come, but uh, I just want to thank you all. I thank all who joined. We had quite a uh, robust attendance today from what I can see. So thank you to all of you uh, and to those who submitted questions. I want to also let everyone know that our next panel will be on mobility and that is on June 4th at the same time and details for those will be um, released. We have an equally stellar panel for that one as well. So um, look for details on that. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, stay yeah. safe and healthy. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Very well. <laughs>